this podcast, we go one step beyond publications and guidelines to speak directly with leading experts in interventional pulmonology. This podcast will address not only fundamental topics and exciting publications, but also unconventional topics for which the evidence base isn't that robust. The views expressed on this podcast are those of the speaker and not necessarily endorsed by the AABIP. This is your host, Dodit Chadda, an assistant professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And with that, let's dive into the next episode. Our topic for discussion today is bronchoscopic ablative therapies for central airway obstruction. And our guest today is a highly respected and charismatic leader in our field, Dr. Otis Rickman. Dr. Rickman is an associate professor of medicine and thoracic surgery at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. Thank you for joining me on the podcast today, Dr. Rickman. Thank you, Dr. Shala. Uh, do you have any conflicts of interest to disclose that are relevant to today's discussion? Uh, no, I don't think so. Not relevant to this discussion. I do have uh, conflicts of, uh, or I have relationships uh, with companies related to navigational bronchoscopy and uh, but uh, none related to ablative technology. Perfect. Okay, so let's start by discussing uh, the dinosaur in the ablative technologies, lasers. So NDYAG has been most commonly used, um, uh, it's the most commonly used laser and has been the most commonly used laser for malignant central airway obstruction um, for ablative therapy. And uh, cumulatively, if you review the data, I could come across 10 good studies, uh, including over 2,000 patients, and the success of restoring AV patency is approximately 90%. So, uh, Dr. Rickman, do all tumors respond equally well to NDAG? And uh, what techniques and settings can I use to modify the laser tissue effects? Yeah, uh, so you, know, you mentioned it in your intro that uh, it is uh, kind of a dinosaur. and um, I remember the first time uh, using the ND YAG laser uh, when I was in my training at uh, Mayo. The the machine was as big as a refrigerator. Well, maybe not quite a refrigerator, but uh, definitely like a washing machine. And uh, we had to roll it in and hook it up to this uh, uh, pump and a uh, thing to pump the water out, and uh, it would leak. And uh, it was uh, it was a very interesting machine, but uh, uh, it was. Uh, certainly had its heyday, uh, I think, in the uh, mid-80s and uh, early 90s. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of data, as you mentioned, uh, came out uh, looking at ND YAG. And, uh, and it was a very popular laser. Uh, you know, Dr. Dumon and uh, Dr. Cortese and uh, many others uh, sort of popularized uh, its uh, use. And uh, still, I think, uh, to this day in uh, Europe, uh, um, Dr. Duto uh, is, uh, you know, still you know, really using the YAG. And I would say that kind of halfway through uh, my training and certainly early into my, um, uh, whenever I was a junior faculty member, uh, the uh, YAG was sort of going away and uh, we ended up uh, getting a, a different type of laser, which I think we'll talk about later. Uh, but uh, you asked about, uh, uh, do all tissues uh, respond uh, equally to the YAG? And the answer to that is no. Uh, and so a lot of it depends on the color uh, and the absorptive spectrum uh, and uh, uh, the uh, and then the wavelength uh, of the light. And so the ND YAG uh, has a uh, wavelength that's about 1,064 nanometers. And so um, depending on uh, what watch you set at and how close uh, you hold the fiber uh, to the tissue, uh, you can uh, vary uh, whether you're getting more of a uh, photocoagulation uh, or a cutting uh, type of, uh, uh, of action uh, from the laser, uh, which is, uh, you know, one of the very nice uh, things about it. It's also non-contact. So uh, for people who've used electrocautery and have had, you know, seen kind of the issues with that whenever you're touching the electrocautery and you get all that coagulum built up on it, that doesn't happen uh, with the YAG laser. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it's a, uh, it is a, you know, the dinosaur, but it's also the workhorse and uh, the grand old man, I think, uh, in the room and uh, still has uh, uh, a lot of uses and a lot of people do use it. Yeah, so so you, you alluded, alluded to this. So the power density can be adjusted by adjusting the wattage and the distance of the fiber to the tissue. And I guess a lot of the effect depends on the absorptive and scattering coefficients. So in general, longer wavelengths uh, have greater penetration and lesser scatter 
uh, and the lasers like the NDAG are good for hemostasis and photo dissection. Uh, but a similar laser, the ND YAP, which has um, a 1340 nanometer wavelength, has achieved similar success in only one study that I could find in malignant central airway obstruction, which included 34 patients only. Uh, it may allow for better devascularization and coagulation despite its longer wavelength because it has a 20 times greater absorptive uh, absorption coefficient in water compared to the NDAG. The homium YAG, on the other hand, um, or the HOYAG, uh, has a longer wavelength again, but it has approximately 100 times more greater absorption coefficient in water than the NDAG, thereby enabling it to be a reliable coagulator, just like the NDAG, but also a good cutter uh, because of its long wavelength. Uh, and again, the homium YAG, I could come across only one study in malignant central airway obstruction where in 54 patients, airway recanalization success was at 72%. So is it fair to say that if a physician has received training in the YAP or the homium YAG laser, or if they don't have the YAG, these technologies can be used interchangeably by just adjusting a few settings? Yeah, uh, so I will tell you that our laser safety committee doesn't, uh, uh, and so unless you've specifically been uh, tra trained on um, the YAP uh, or the or the homium uh, YAG, um, you will not be able to use those. Uh, just because of, uh, you know, just as you mentioned, I think that the the ND YAG uh, can photocoagulate and can cut uh, as a great, um, you know, lots of different things that you can adjust on that to get great penetration or photocoagulation versus the ND YAP. At least in my experience, uh, even though they say that it can be a great, uh, you know, for tissue dissection or photo dissection, uh, I find it uh, more of a photocoagulator uh, rather than uh, rather than a cutter. Um, and uh, the same thing with the homium YAG. Uh, again, same thing uh, is that as you um, as you increase that uh, wavelength, uh, it's uh, it's more of a cutter. Uh, but you can still get uh, some photocoagulation with it. And then one of the things that, um, you know, that um, that I'll end up uh, using uh, sometimes, especially for very precise work, is a CO2 laser. Uh, and, uh, and then that's uh, one that uh, is very precise, uh, has uh, no photocoagulation at all, and is just a cutter. So based um, on just on what you just said, uh, another laser that has historically been used for cutting is the KTP laser. It doesn't have a long wavelength, uh, so it's actually got poor penetrative effects. Um, but uh, I've seen it being used for upper airway laryngeal lesions to facilitate the mechanical dilatation of uh, tracheal strictures. Um, do you see a use for the CO2 laser? Uh, I mean, or for the KTP laser nowadays that we have a CO2 laser that uh, can be used through our bronchoscopes and uh, the electrocautery knives to give such good clean cuts with uh, adjustable adjacent coagulable effect. Is the, C is yeah. the KTB laser just of uh, historic interest now? Yeah, I, you know, so uh, our ENT surgeons uh, still use it. Uh, they like to use it uh, in the office uh, and we'll actually use it through nasal pharyngoscopy or something like that to uh -huh. hit polyps on the vocal cord. So it's uh, very precise um, and um, um, and then the and it's more portable, so most of the CO2 lasers are still pretty bulky and require an apparatus uh, sort of to bring in. And the KTP laser, depending on which one you have, can be in a little box uh, that uh, is more portable. So you know uh, there are many different ways uh, to get things done, and I think whatever works for you. Uh, most of the time, these lasers have been purchased a long time ago, and uh, people will keep using them until they you know completely break down. Mm -hmm. So do you use the CO2 laser through a flexible scope or a rigid scope? Uh, so there are two ways uh, to use it. So there's uh, you can use a CO2 laser through an operating microscope, uh, which is uh, what the ENT surgeons uh, use. But uh, they now have a flexible fiber uh, that you can use through a flexible scope uh, or through uh, a rigid guide uh, through a through a uh, uh, so one of the one of the rigid guiding cannulas uh, through a rigid scope. Mm, OK. Um, okay, so um, not everyone is familiar with these lasers. Uh, what are some advantages that lasers have over spectrocautery contact or non-contact? 
I think the, probably the, the biggest advantage uh, that uh, the lasers have uh, over electro cautery is the non-contact uh, portion of it uh, so that you don't have to um, uh, worry about uh, getting uh, the tip uh, uh, all coagulated up and having to come out and uh, clean things up. And they can be uh, a little bit uh, faster. Um, and, uh, and, and, then, and, and a lot of times you can actually make them uh, be uh, more precise. And I think that's the, probably the, the key thing that uh, advantage that lasers have over electrocautery. And uh, looking at the acquired data, the electrocautery, mainly APC is the most commonly used um, bronchoscopic ablative modality used in the U uh, United States. Um, again, I think uh, there's a lot of user familiarity with uh, with this tool. It's easily accessible and uh, easy to use. But um, what are some scenarios wherein you would think that it is better or safer to use uh, electrocautery over uh, laser? Uh, so, you know, I think a lot of it depends on sort of training and familiarity with the tool. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Tom Sucheta said uh, a long time ago, uh, you know, he was one of the proponents of using uh, uh, electrocautery uh, in the airways. It's a poor man's laser and uh, mm -hmm. it's ubiquitous. Uh, it's around uh, everywhere. Uh, you know, every hospital has uh, a, uh, you know, an electrosurgical generator, you know, multiple ones, you know, in the ORs and the GI suites and the bronchoscopy rooms, even in the clinics. And so it uh, is uh, ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. um, as far as uh, when you would prefer to use electrocautery uh, over a laser, I think that it's a lot uh, um, harder uh, to get uh, into complications uh, with electrocautery. So because the depth of penetration uh, mm -hmm. is not as high as with the ND YAG. Uh, so, uh, you know, I've seen uh, really bad problems uh, happen with the ND YAG um, whenever you can't stay uh, parallel. Um, uh, with the airway so if you have to start uh, going a little perpendicular or digging into the wall or something like that and so laser uh, fiber <clears throat> uh, especially if you're using a uh, rigid bronchoscopy uh, can be harder to direct uh, and if you start getting out of any of the main stem airways or the trachea then mm -hmm. uh, what happens uh, is that uh, now you're going to be less able to control your depth of penetration you're not going to have cartilages there to protect you. And so I think you can treat a little more distally uh, with uh, APC and electrocautery than you can with a laser, especially an indie gag laser, um, uh, and have less fear of uh, you know penetrating through the wall and into a blood vessel. Perfect. So the poor man goes to those deep areas where the dinosaur won't go. Um, <laughs> yeah. So um, again, I guess that's also because it, you really want to keep the laser fiber uh, along the axis of the airway, and that gets progressively more difficult if you go into low bar airways. Correct. Um, in addition to the difficulty of angulating a rigid scope if you're using that with a laser, I guess. Um, okay. But uh, Dr. Rickman, are you using um, uh, contact electrocautery probes at all uh, for ablation? Do they have a role in today's world? Yeah, you know, I, I think they do. So uh, I, um, so uh, at my previous institution, uh, we used uh, mostly uh, Indy Yag or Indy Yap, uh, but uh, you know, after I came uh, to uh, Vanderbilt, uh, Vanderbilt was a place that had to rent uh, all their lasers, and so you had to know what laser fiber you wanted to use, you know, to start with, so you could have a vendor uh, come in and bring your laser with you, and uh, and so I quickly found that to be quite cumbersome, um, and I guess that would be a, a disadvantage for lasers because they're super expensive, and you know, a lot of places have to have those, and so. Uh, I actually uh, uh, bought a uh, you know a set of flexible probes, uh, a blunt tip probe, a blade, uh, you know, uh, hot forceps, and a snare, uh, and you know I've used uh, those uh, same tools, uh, you know, for you know several years, uh, and uh, they were not expensive uh, to buy. You know, whenever you look at the a laser fiber, you know, you know, some, you know, depending on which one you get, it might be 1200 or 2000 a fiber. And I got these, uh, you know, electric cautery probes uh, for two, 300 a piece and they're reusable mm -hmm. and uh, you can use them over and over and over again. And so uh, I will say that uh, the blunt tip cautery probe, uh, either in coagulation mode, uh, depending on what I'm wanting to, uh, you know, what I'm wanting to accomplish uh, or, um, the uh, or in a cut mode uh, to you know you know more precisely uh, slice a lesion uh, is um, 
uh, is my daily workhorse. And then, of course, there's the snares uh, for pedunculated lesions, uh, which are real nice. And then the blade, uh, which we use uh, for making very precise cuts uh, in uh, uh, mostly in tracheal stenoses. Um, and now, you know, even for a more precise cut over the Olympus blade, uh, there's uh, uh, more of a, a guillotine uh, sort of thing that you can use that was uh, developed uh, for GI use uh, called a microtome uh, that they used uh, for uh, cutting uh, the, uh, the ampulla in uh, pancreatitis. Uh, and it makes very thin cuts, uh, and so it's just like a little uh, razor wire uh, that goes in, and uh, and it's um, uh, even thinner than you can get uh, with the YAG laser, uh, so or with the CO2 laser. So the cut is very precise and small. Um, so uh, I think that the electric cautery has a lot of advantages uh, mm -hmm. over uh, over laser in that uh, arena. And then, and then the most, I think the most ubiquitous one uh, that's used is uh, argon plasma coagulation. So again, electrocautery, but using a uh, plasma uh, <clears throat> plasma stream of argon to conduct the electricity. And one of the nice things about it is it actually turned around a corner. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can go at 90 degree angles, uh, which can be harder with electrocautery and it's impossible with a laser uh, to get it to, to do that. And, uh, and it's great for, photocoagulating a, a large surface area very quickly. The problem with it is uh, it's a very superficial technique and it's uh, hard to, not impossible. Lots of people have done it. They've told me over and over again. So yes, you can ablate with this, uh, but it takes a long time. Uh, and, uh, and you have to have the wattage, uh, you know, turned up uh, pretty high. But, uh, you know, and again, we talk about these ablative technologies in the airway, but usually they're complementary. So even with the laser, so it's photomechanical resection or electromechanical resection, uh, depending on which modality you're using. And so the idea is that you're devascularizing the tumor uh, so that it doesn't bleed as much, uh, but you're not completely, you know, turning up the wattage and just completely, you know, uh, frying the lesion and make it vaporize. So you, you, you keep your settings low to photocoagulate it, and then you use the cutting tip of the rigid scope or forceps or uh, a cryo probe to cryo extract or something like that. Another way to get big pieces of tissues out mm -hmm. and chunk it. So that way you're not uh, delivering out a ton of energy to the airway wall and potentially creating a fistula. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, thank you for that. So uh, quickly on the complications with these thermal uh, ablative therapies, I mean, hemorrhage, airway perforation, airway fire, these are all very uncommon if used correctly and often avoidable. A uh, unique complication with APC is gas embolism. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, the best way to avoid this is uh, avoid uh, dead ends with, uh, with the APC probe and don't use too high flows. Uh, what's your definition of a high flow with, uh, you know, on your APC settings? Because across the literature, people use up to two liters, and, uh, two liters per minute flows, and, and they don't report gas embolisms. And I start getting nervous above 0.8. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I think the standard setting is 0.4, uh, and, and I'd have to go back and look at, uh, at the, at the machine, but I think that's, you know, kind of what ours is set up uh, for most of the time. Uh, and, uh, I think the main thing to remember about gas symbolism, uh, is that if you if your scope is not wedged, you have a way to mm -hmm. egress and, and the tip of the, of the probe is not buried into the mucosa or into the tumor, it's very hard to get a gas embolism. Uh, and I think that's most of the problem. I mean, because you can set your flow up really high and uh, keep your uh, probe away from the uh, mucosa or away from the tumor, just as long as it's not embedded. Uh, and chances are, I mean, you're not going to get a uh, embolism. Now, that being said, if you've got something that's really bleeding uh, and it's a venous uh, bleed um, and uh, you have your flow set up really high, you know, I, I, you know, I guess it is possible. Uh, uh, you know, to do that. But there are a lot of things that have, have to happen uh, for that mm -hmm. uh, for that to happen. I think it's an extremely rare, it's devastating when it happens, but an extremely rare complication. Absolutely. All right, let's move on to cold paste therapies. Uh, cryotherapy has been around for a long time and uh, predominantly uh, in the past, it's been used with uh, delayed effect uh, or so-called cryoprobe based therapy. The immediate effect use of a cryoprobe is, is called cryo-recanalization or cryo-debulking. And then there's the new cryospray. Uh, 
Uh, but the evidence for the cryospray comes from only one study for malignant central airway obstruction. So, um, Dr. Rickman, with the cryoprobe-based therapy for delayed effect, uh, if you look at the older studies, successful restoration of airway patency and improvement in performance status was reported variably between 60 to 90 percent of the cases. Um, but uh, given that it's a non-immediate effect tool uh, or modality, and it needs a cleanup bronchoscopy, and th the historic success numbers aren't as good with other technologies, do you? see a use for this therapy in patients with malignant central airway obstruction? Yes, that's a, that's a good question. So um, uh, there are a couple of, a couple of interesting tidbits uh, about uh, cryotherapy. And so, you know, so cryo uh, the cryo probe and cryo recanalization actually came along in the late seventies, early eighties. Uh, and uh, 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 Praveen uh, Mather and uh, uh, Dr. David Sanderson uh, at Mayo were uh, sort of pioneers in this, and uh, and they did a lot of the early work uh, with uh, sort of cryo adhesion and cryo recanalization, uh, that sort of things for immediate debulking. Um, and then the laser came along, and so the, you know got fancy laser versus you know freezing cryoprobe. You, you know who won that you know history, uh, and so uh, it kind of went. The cryoprobe uh, kind of went away and fell away, and then it uh, sort of came back uh, onto the scene uh, whenever uh, Irby uh, developed a flexible probe uh, that could be placed uh, through the bronchoscope. And uh, which, you know, uh, because not as many people are trained to use rigid bronchoscopy, this uh, flexible probe opened that, uh, that technique back up uh, to uh, a larger audience of pulmonologists and thoracic surgeons. And so, uh, as you mentioned, uh, if you just go in and freeze, uh, you know, much like a PDT, uh, there's going to have to be a cleanup bronchoscopy done uh, at a later date because uh, what you've done is uh, you've killed the tissue, but you haven't removed the tissue. And so uh, what that has led to is uh, people uh, doing a combination of uh, sort of um, uh, the cryotherapy uh, for immediate killing, and then after a few freeze-thaw cycles, uh, then uh, leaving the probe there to stick, and then they will uh, remove a bunch of the uh, tissue by uh, uh, sort of exploiting the dual Thompson effect and uh, the tissue that uh, is sticking to the tip uh, mm -hmm. of a uh, cold piece of metal, and then in block, uh, remove the cryoprobe uh, and uh, flexible scope uh, to remove large chunks of tissue. Uh, and can be very effective, but uh, one of the down, big downsides I see with this technique uh, is the bleeding uh, that uh, occurs afterwards, uh, because even though you've uh, frozen a portion of it and uh, got it to be hemostatic, uh, that base uh, still bleeds a lot. And uh, so uh, it's not my favorite uh, technique uh, to use, uh, but uh, you certainly can uh, use it in uh, certain circumstances. Uh, but, um, uh, and I think that it's one of those ones that you know, if you're, um, if you don't have as much experience uh, in uh, in the airway, especially if uh, uh, you know with uh, cryo recanalization or in, or uh, some of the hot therapies uh, that sort of thing, it's really hard to get into trouble uh, with the cryo probe. So you could go down and treat uh, and not really have to worry about fistula formation. And in just a couple of days, you come back and you clean out some of the dead tissue. You're not going to get into a lot of bleeding. Uh, you're not going to get into hypoxia situations, uh, that sort of thing. So I think it's a very safe uh, technique to just go in and freeze uh, and then wait a couple of days and go back in and, and then take it out. So I think that's what appeals to a lot of people uh, about that technology. I think it's the same thing that appeals to people about uh, brachytherapy and PDT. Um, one of the things I'm really excited about uh, is this you know, spray cryotherapy. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and its application uh, in, I don't think it's going to have an application uh, for critical central airway obstruction, uh, again, because of the reasons uh, that you mentioned before, is that uh, it doesn't open the airway at all. But uh, for the sort of the diffuse carpeting uh, lesions or respiratory papillomatosis, and then for benign lesions, uh, the, uh, the, the cryo effects on uh, very vascular tumors, preferential, you know, uh, cryo effects on vascular tumors and cell killing uh, 
and then preserving the cartilage, preserving the extracellular matrix, uh, all the collagen and allowing good tissue to grow back in there is very appealing. And that's been shown in other fields. Um, uh, but uh, again, you know, as you mentioned, the literature is more sparse uh, in pulmonary. I think it's probably going to have more of a role in uh, strictures and benign disease uh, than it does in malignant central airway obstruction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a very uh, exciting area to look forward to. I actually have a cryospray at my disposal, but I haven't used one. Um, so, so you're talking about using the cryospray mainly at the base, right? Like so that. Um, airway structures preserved, healing can be better, and you're treating beyond what is visible. That's correct. So, so you know, currently the way that uh, we're using, we're actually tracking uh, a, a series of patients uh, right now, is that we would go in and you use, you know, whatever modality you want to get the bulk of the tumor out of the airway. Uh, and then uh, that, uh, you know, the tumor surface uh, that's left there, Rather than doing, you know, if you, you know, if, if you treat circumferentially with a hot therapy, uh, it's going to cause a stenosis. So even though you get rid of the cancer, it causes a stenosis. And so with cryospray, you can deliver a lot of energy uh, to the residual tumor base uh, and uh, and then kill that tumor. And it's got a fairly good penetration depending on how long you spray, how far you're away from the tissue, you know, that sort of thing, uh, and what your flow rate is. Um, it will get a penetration of about two to three millimeters or so. And the nice thing about uh, cryo is that uh, the blood vessels next to it have a heat sink effect. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and so the blood vessels, the wall is protected because the flow of the blood go through it keeps it nice and warm. And then, uh, and so you don't have to worry about fistula formation or anything like that. And so uh, we'll see, you know, how that goes, but I think cryo spray is probably applied in the same way. Um, would be applied sort of the same people that you would apply PDT to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or kind of use it in the same same or similar fashion. Yeah, no, that, absolutely. I think that's very exciting. So, so it, just so that I understand this correctly, you think that using a cryospray for a base of a tumor uh, or any lesion would be better than using cryoprobe, mainly because of the lower temperature and possibly deeper effects? Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So if you use a cryo probe, so depending on which probe you have, uh, so just think about the surface area. So a spray cryotherapy can, you know, basically cover, you know, an entire lesion entirely in the airway in, in one application mm -hmm. versus if you're using a probe, uh, then uh, if it's a 1.9 probe or a 2.4 probe, you're going to get just, you know, a few millimeters out from your probe. And you have to do this sort of, uh, you know, it's almost like freckles uh, where you, you move around and uh, move the probe around and, you know, treat different areas to try to get the whole thing covered. And it's very tedious and long. Uh, and so, uh, and so, uh, and then with a cryo probe, uh, it's only going down uh, to, you know, minus 70 or minus 80, depending on whether you're using nitrous oxide or carbon dioxide uh, in, a, in the, and the cryo spray is, you know, going down to minus 190, I think, mm -hmm. uh, for uh, liquid nitrogen. Uh, so it's getting a, a much more rapid uh, freeze. And so you can do more freeze thaw cycle, cycles at a higher energy. And so we know that the quicker that you freeze and the longer the thaw, then the more cell death you get uh, rather than a slower freeze. So, um, so you can use it in combination, you know, like you use a cryo probe. I did this uh, last week uh, for a carcinoid tumor in the bronchus or medius. Um, and I wasn't sure whether I'd be, be able to get a loop cautery snare around it. Turns out in retrospect, uh, I would have been able to, uh, but I'd already had the cryo probe set up. And so we just uh, uh, removed the, the, the tumor with uh, uh, the cryo probe and then sprayed the little bit of stalk or base uh, that was left uh, with cryo spray. And uh, we'll see how they do, but uh, I know that they won't get a stenosis, uh, and uh, which is what would have happened if I'd have used a laser or if I'd have used uh, 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 cautery. That's awesome. So I'm going to take out my cryo spray tomorrow, and maybe I get time for lunch. Um, so yeah, but... well, so just be careful <laughs> with it uh, because one of the, the main thing is that, uh, and so because it's liquid nitrogen that mm -hmm. goes 
And so it expands 700 times. So one yes, milliliter egress, later turns yeah. into 700 milliliters. And so you got to have active egress. And so mm -hmm. that, uh, um, that uh, and so that limits how far distal you can go uh, in the airway. Uh, and so if you're, uh, if you're getting, you know, sort of down into some smaller airways, you really have to be careful uh, because your scope, uh, if you use it through a flexible scope, uh, could be blocking that airway. Uh, but I think I feel pretty comfortable uh, treating uh, sort of right upper lobe uh, and then down in the bronchus intermedius and down the, in, to the distal left vein stem bronchus in most people. So, But you're using a rigid bronchoscope for your egress or are you deflating the endotracheal tube cuff? Uh, so uh, we rarely ever use it to, through an endotracheal tube. So it's either an, through an LMA uh, or through a uh, rigid scope. Okay. And and again, if you you know sort of if you know, the company uh, recommends that you use an endotracheal tube with the cuff deflated uh, or a rigid scope. Um, and so you know if I if I do math uh, on that and I look at an LMA, so LMA sits on top of the larynx. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, uh, uh, and so your, your only narrowing is going to be the six millimeters of your scope that goes through your glottis. Absolutely. Uh, and so that's the, that's the decrease, that, you know, that's the only surface. So if you've got a nice setting in LMA and then you think about it, so like, uh, with an LMA, uh, the LMA pops off at about 20 centimeters of water. Uh, and so if, even if the carbon dioxide is expanding and I have, you know, some sort of plug on my LMA, once it hits 20 centimeters of water, it's going to start leaking around the LMA in the oropharynx and not cause a pneumothorax because we're not ever going to cause a pneumothorax at 20 centimeters of water. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so I think that LMA is probably underutilized uh, for cryospray application. Uh, and if you think about the endotracheal tube, so if you have an 8 endotracheal tube uh, in, and you have, and so you put that through the glottis external diameter of the ADO endotracheal tube is what, mm -hmm. probably 11 millimeters or something like that. And then you've got six millimeters uh, of scope uh, because it has to be a, a therapeutic scope that goes through the, the endotracheal tube. So you've got two millimeters. And then if you think about the average size of the glottis, mm -hmm. you can start. I think you have more surface area uh, or more flow potential. Uh, from an LMA rather than an endotracheal tube. But as you mentioned, if you are doing it through an endotracheal tube, make sure you let the cuff down. That makes so much sense. So no endotracheal tube, I'm gonna either use my rigid scope with the suction or an LMA, perfect. Um, if I may just add one more thing though, you said about cryospray and uh, CIS. I think one advantage uh, PDP gives is, um, you know, it treats what we can't see. Um, and, you know, we don't know how extensive these lesions are. And I think, I think that's, uh, uh, potentially an area for research for anyone who's uh, using the cryospray out there. Uh, in today's yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In today's absolutely. episode, I mean, I've intentionally avoided discussing uh, PDD just for uh, the purpose of time. We will have a separate episode dedicated to this topic um, uh, by another very esteemed guest. So, Dr. Rickman, this has been fantastic, uh, and it's been wonderful hosting you. Do you have um, any closing comments or words of caution for our listeners? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I think it's an exciting time uh, for uh, uh, to be an interventional pulmonologist or a thoracic surgeon. Uh, lots of uh, new technologies uh, coming our way, and um, I think that uh, you should use whatever tool uh, that you're most comfortable with, that you've been trained uh, the most on, uh, that fits your needs. Um, and um, it's... Um, I, and, and I think that the key thing there is training, uh, mm -hmm. is that, uh, you know, uh, these uh, these technologies and tools, um, uh, you know, people can get into trouble with them uh, pretty quick. And um, and, and so you got to know uh, what the what the effects are and uh, what the effects of the tool that you're using are, what its uh, tissue tool interactions uh, are and uh, what the major complications are, what the safe areas that you can use them in. And, uh, and, and most of the time that's going to, uh, you know, occur, you know, from a, a dedicated uh, training program, um, uh, rather than uh, just sort of uh, picking something off the shelf and, and, uh, starting to use it. Uh, so that would be my, uh, I guess that'd be my parting uh, comment is, uh, use what tool that you're comfortable with, uh, and that, uh, you're, uh, that you're trained to use.
Fantastic. So many pearls of wisdom. And for all of you guys who want to listen to more pearls of wisdom from Dr. Rickman, follow him on Twitter. You'll get a pearl of wisdom every day. He's uh, <laughs> one of those he's one of those dinosaurs who is not extinct yet on uh, Twitter and he's very active. So um, I, I think I think that's something everyone should consider doing if you haven't done so already. Uh, so again, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Rickman. It's been a pleasure. All right. You just call me T-Rex. <laughs> All right. It's been a pleasure, T-Rex. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. With that, we conclude an exciting episode here on the AABIP podcast. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed hosting it. Do also check out our website, theippodcast.com, and please do provide us with feedback and suggestions on what topic and which expert you want to hear next. Until next time, take care.